From the Garden of Eden to the top corner of your English teacher's desk, apples have played an equal role in history's most remarkable days and also its most mundane. The sounds of teeth snapping through the skin, sinking into flesh, and spitting out seeds echo through space forever and onward. And for most of our earthly hours consumed by appetite, it has been documented to be a lopsided relationship between these two things, man and apple. Man getting the sweet taste and abundant nutrients, apples getting nothing but pain and stomach acids. But this story is not found in our history. Buried in the lawful patterns of predator and prey, we stumble upon an irregularity, an inversion, an instance of apples biting back. SCP-4608, also known as Appleseed, was a 60-acre apple orchard containing over 22,000 trees, located just on the outskirts of Milan, Indiana. A town so small it strains your eyes as you squint to find it with a microscope, hovering just over a map. And to see what was actually happening within the curious fringes of society took even greater exploration, not just of the eyes, but also of the mind. Because what would eventually be seen would not so easily be comprehended. Physical senses are just the surface, and we need to go deeper. Our story begins with a great logging company looking to take ownership of the most fertile land they could find in the Great Lakes region. Ideally land that overproduces conifer growth so that the return on their investment would be plentiful and perpetual. These lumberjacked men knew what they wanted. Beneath their red flannel shirts and muddy boots was a deep intelligence and understanding of nature. Their process of assessing the land's value was meticulously calculated. They knew the soil both by the experience of their calloused hands and the literature of their study. They tracked various bird species' migration patterns in the area to assess what kind of seeds they'd be carrying and contributing to soil by way of their stool. They understood the local laws relating to clear-cutting and conservation and how both would affect their profit margins. This is all to say it wasn't just a speculative purchase. This was planned through and through and dwelled on. And yet, even then, with scrupulous eyes and careful crew, they missed the warning signs. SCP-4608 checked all their boxes, and then some. What could go wrong? And so they acquired the land, unwittingly purchasing the peril that came with it. On the first day of owning the property, one crew member noticed the branches did not sway in the same direction as the wind blew. He noticed the leaves didn't float down in agreement with their feathery weight but rather crashed to the soil like two-dimensional anvils and grand pianos. The roots were not ones you simply trip over. Instead, it seemed as if they stuck their leg out to trip you. When birds perched themselves up high and sang their songs, their cadence carried all the eeriness of an SOS. With all this said, he was happy to have acquired the land, and having already picked up and moved his family from the West Coast to now live and work out in Milan, Indiana, he decided it was best to look past his concerns. After all, it was the first day on the new site, and excitement was in the air, but with it also an amorphous, anxious energy. During the first logging expedition within SCP-4608, this same member of the crew hiked the grounds to better familiarize himself with the environment he'd be working on, hoping that if he managed the land properly and extracted the lumber as efficiently as his late father did, he would be able to help build the business and give his children the life he always promised them. He brought with him his notepad and took detailed records of his surroundings. He figured to achieve his goals and sustain long-term yields, he'd have to cooperate with his environment, but he never questioned if his environment wanted to cooperate with him. Would this question have changed the course of action? Or is brooding on the preference of plants an empty gesture best left for hippies at Woodstock? Either way, the orchard let it be known how it felt about a collaboration when hours later, the man was found dead. It was first believed by his co-workers to be a result of a safety equipment malfunction. Maybe it was a simple matter of thinking the skitter was in park when it was really in neutral. Maybe the knuckle boom loader went on the fritz how it does when the humidity ramps up. Maybe machinery really was to blame, in which case you call it a fluke and ask no more. After all, there's only so many questions you can ask a robot. But initial belief is a fickle thing, and it wasn't long until first impressions were called into question by the courts of critical thinking. The questions of the crew, however, only rang briefly, because shortly after the first death fell a sequence of others. In a matter of days, all of the remaining crew members were declared dead or missing, a word reserved for search parties still clinging to hope. 
a hot potato they would have been wise to abandon. For while it was hope that brought these search parties together, it was hope that sent them off, never to be seen again. The Foundation was then alerted to the occurrences surrounding SCP-4608 by police reports accompanied by a photograph. A photograph of an SCP-4608-1, an organism consisting of unidentified plant-like muscular structures and a periderm resembling those found on common hardwoods. From the photograph alone, it was clear that this three-meter-tall organism was capable of committing the violence recently endured. Forceful in its demeanor, aggressive in its presence, and territorial in its perception, the photograph of SCP-4608-1 led to an even bigger question. Is this plant-like creature grown by nature or sown by man? After extensive research by the Foundation, records were retrieved that indicate the entirety of the 60-acre land was sown into life by John Chapman in 1826. Chapman was the type of man you could mistake for a scarecrow, both for reasons of preferred garb and body language. He was treated as such too. His personal space was respected, maybe too much. He spent his life alone, only accompanied and comforted by the things he planted. He maintained these acres all by himself until his eventual death in 1845, and it's then that it's believed SCP-4608 became unstable, reassigning its objective from comfort to chaos. When the newspaper came out the next Sunday, John Chapman's obituary painted him as a priest of the Allen County Church. But was this just the art of illusion? For as far as we know, no records of a chapel or congregation exist. A quiet choir, indeed. Come to think of it, it seems that everything within this 60-acre orchard was destined to be silenced one way or another, by violent force or even by conscious decision-making. See, while the SCP Foundation has had a long track record of subduing anomalies by methods of capture and containment, not all things are suited for locks and chains. SCP-4608 is better covered with a story than a tarp. A fruitless field that once produced at an unmanageable pace is now rendered incapable of supporting growth. Most will think it's due to a toxic spill. In truth, the spill wasn't that of chemicals on soil, but rather corpses on crops. A week after receiving the photograph of 4608-1, Site-81 sent a three-man investigation team into Milan. Their adventure was equally abrupt, a story with no reportable beginning or middle, but simply a predictable end. After four days of no communication, the Foundation presumed the three agents no different than their steak dinner, dead meat. And only then, after the Foundation's failure to solve the case, was it understood that what we were to be looking for wasn't people at all but rather answers to more nebulous questions. What's really happening here? And why is this happening? Following the loss of communication with the investigation team, Site-81 dispatched a high-risk response team, Mobile Strike Force Bravo-7, aka Hometown Heroes. These men had all the makings of heroes, and they were determined to prove themselves worthy of the title. While the Alpha Squad moved north towards the incident site, Beta Squad headed east, and Gamma Squad hurried west the crews covering all directions of the compass but south, a coincidentally symbolic gesture, as if to say, we will not be taken down. The mission was simple in theory, find out what happened to the previous team and why. But alas, missions never are as easy as their objective statement reads. In practice, some might even call them impossible. As Alpha neared the incident site, they noticed the shadows on the ground beneath them did not resemble the shape of the leaves in the canopy above. They heard small drops of liquid tap, tap, tap on their helmets. Yet, it wasn't raining, was it? Alpha One ran his finger across the top of his helmet and then examined the residue left on his skin. It was raining, just not water. Oh, God! Upon looking up, he witnessed the reasons for both irregularities. Bodies hung from branches by their intestines, casting shadow puppets with their lifeless limbs. Blood dripped down like a leaky faucet. What did this? But before he could even ponder the answer, he heard a loud shriek from his radio, so loud that the radio itself vibrated, shaking its way loose from his hand and falling to the dirt. He bent down and picked it up, and this time gripped tighter, as if to tell whoever was responsible for that noise that they will not get away that easily. He and his crew followed this sound like a game of Marco Polo, blind to what may be ahead. They extended their guns and pointed them into the distant tree line, like zombie arms reaching outward in the pool towards the resonance of Polo. 
a small comfort in a giant game of distress. As they pressed forward, Alpha Squad proceeded past all signs that pointed them back, stepping over dead bodies like puddles on a rainy day. Soon they found themselves crouching down next to human remains, attending brief and hurried funerals for all their closest comrades, torn between staying to pay respect and marching along to earn it. The chest cavities of the fallen had been ripped open and filled with apples, a grim foresight into what they were up against. But nothing they could have ever imagined would prepare them for what they were about to see, and they wouldn't have to wait long. Another loud shriek from Alpha One's radio. It shot free from its grip and landed again in the dirt. The squad tried to ignore the metaphorical implications of this reoccurrence, quickly picking up the radio and shrugging it off, as if the five-second rule applied equally to communication systems as candy bars. They pressed forward, maybe out of bravery, maybe out of shame of going back. And while moving through the trees, they began to notice something alarming etched on their bark. What was it? There were unnaturally deep grooves on the base of almost every one of the trees. But what exactly were they from? Scratches from an animal or beast? Infection? Decay? Their eyes drew closer, but proximity brought them no clarity. These sigils and symbols could be dated back to occult Norse religion, but in that moment, they were incomprehensible to the men. Yet the message, even if misinterpreted, was very clear. Beware. Another shrieking cry over the radio. The bullets! The bullets aren't... They're not working! They can't... They can't penetrate the bark! The grass is no greener over on the east side of the orchard, where Beta Squad gets lunged at by an SCP-4608-1. Their defenses are futile, but they fight nonetheless, sending rounds to the attacker's chest, leading to... nothing. If SCP-4608 had a health meter, it wouldn't have budged in the slightest. Understanding the negligible impact of their efforts and assessing their injuries, Beta Squad scurries to retreat to an abandoned chapel, taking a brief refuge from war only later to be named. Quickly, they barricade the door. In the chapel, Beta-9 tends to Beta-6's wounds, who is in the worst shape of them all, cut, bloody, and beaten. As he lays there grimacing, he shines his flashlight up and down the chapel's walls, until he finds a reason to stop and holds it steady. Illuminated is an assortment of human skulls, and if this wasn't traumatic enough, he then spotted apple seeds embedded in Beta-6's wounds, apple seeds that were starting to sprout. Beta-9 gave it to him straight. This is gonna hurt. He drew his knife from his belt and lowered it into his comrade's wounds. Beta-9 dug into flesh and bone, picking the seeds out one by one. Beta-6's scream shook the chapel's stained glass windows. As Beta-1 stood guard, he saw a blur rip past him, as if life had suddenly been turned up to three times speed. He spun around in a circle to try and keep his eyes on it, but as his vision refocused, he saw Beta-9 was now dead. He then shifted his gaze to Beta-6, who was looking less and less human by the second. Branches began sprouting out of his body like an all-consuming magic beanstalk. Out of his chest, out of his eyes, out of his mouth. And when there were no more orifices to exit, his body exploded, making way for the new form that had overtaken him. The barrage of branches broke through the windows. Only two of them were lucky to be on the outskirts of inertia. Outside, Gamma-1 was on his knees thanking his dead comrade for the grenade he stole from his back pocket. I could always count on you to have my back, even in death. One hand holding a grenade and the other on his radio, Gamma-1 called off Alpha-7. Alpha-7, request for backup rescinded. Go grab a burger. I'll take it from here. Gamma-1 slowly glanced up and locked eyes with SCP-4608-2, a large apple tree with 13 human faces embedded into it, a perennial plant with great powers, a gymnosperm that had found a voice. Blood poured from SCP-4608-2's empty eye sockets, Gamma-1 smirks. Get some eye drops, sicko. He crawled over to the beast. The faces began yelling at him in indescribable tongues. Let me refer you to a speech therapist. He jokes as he pulls the pin of the grenade and throws it towards the largest of the 13 mouths. SCP-4608-2 chokes on the grenade, forcing it to inhale deeply, the strength of its lungs pulling Gamma-1 toward it and sucking him in. The grenade goes off. SCP-4608-2 explodes. The surrounding trees scream and combust. The orchard goes up in flames. The bodies of the fallen are given an appropriate cremation. Gamma-1's radio lays face up in the dirt. The voice rattles it awake. It's Alpha-7. Gamma-1! Gamma-1, are you there? Can you hear me? Please. Please. It's Alpha-7. Please. Gamma-1? On October 16th, 1947. Gamma-1 was recovered by the Allen County Fire Department, unconscious and suffering from exhaustion and smoke inhalation. The Site-81 concealment team took control of the situation, 
and quarantined the area using the cover story of a toxic chemical hazard. The members of MTF Bravo 7 were posthumously awarded the Foundation Star for their efforts during the neutralization of SCP-4608. And so, the one question that remains is, how? How did SCP-4608-1 become so dangerous, and how did its danger slip by for so many years? Is its volatility by nature, design, or consequence? Could it be that the Foundation failed to understand the complexity of this creation? During Chapman's lifetime, there were no accidents or fatalities coming from SCP-4608. Yet, there is no reason to believe that SCP-4608-1 wasn't always capable of harm. Maybe it always was capable of mass murders, but simply had no reason to kill. What if the logging company never stepped foot on that land, never brought out their sharp blades and heavy machinery? What if this perilous orchard was in fact docile but provoked? What if the proverbial tree only falls in the woods when we force our philosophy on it? Though SCP-4608-2 spoke in unidentifiable sounds, the noises were always recognized and recorded as language. It spoke with intent, even if misunderstood. What it screamed is still unclear. Were they pleas for help, or messages of hate? And would one even be worse than the other? John Chapman might argue, when facing heavy machinery and trained artillery, would raising your voice even be a moral decision at all? Is fight or flight imbued not just in blood, but also in bark? Now go check out SCP-1472 Multiverse Strip Club and SCP-4840 The Flying City of Autodopodopolis for more thoroughly cursed anomalous locations.